which means that in the content that we consume, there is quite often a ton of audio. But audio can be really hard to work with, and in some cases harder than other kinds of media, like images and text and video. And one of the key reasons for that is that it's really hard to get at the different layers or components of sound. Uh, and in this field, we call those stems. And that's what we do at AudioShake, is we use deep learning to open up audio to make it interactive, accessible, useful, power editing tasks. So just so that we're on the same page, let's start with one kind of sound or sound recording, a piece of music. So all of us are familiar with, say, what we hear on a streaming platform or on the radio, like the, what we call the full mix of a song. I don't care what the holds for me. But say we wanted to get a part of that song. Let's say we wanted to simply isolate the vocals. So we would use Audio Shake to rip the vocals from I don't that. Care what the holds for me. Turn up the volume a little bit, too. There we go. Um, and when you can split, say, a song recording or other kinds of recordings into their stems, you can power all kinds of workflows. So if we were just even looking at music, for example, you can do things like remixing, power lyric transcription, help with localization, and getting different audio files uh, ready for local languages, metadata extraction, making audio interactive and customizable, powering all kinds of new fan engagement experiences, new kinds of AV editing tasks that you can't do today, and making audio immersive. And we'll get into some of these, and I'm happy to take more questions too during the Q&A. But first, I wanted to talk about some of the research we do at AudioShake and some of the challenges generally that you face when you're working with audio. So we're all musicians, so we started in music processing research. And the problem with music is we're talking about high fidelity or high resolution audio which means it has a lot of data points. So the models are large and they're computationally expensive. Second, models need to learn long-term dependencies to understand musical structure and coherence. So to think of it really simply, second number one needs to relate to second number two. And they're not independent. Third, music, as any of you know, whoever had opinions about music in say high school or even now, um, music is highly subjective. So we do have lots of quantitative benchmarks that we can use in this field to measure quality. But those benchmarks don't always map to what we would think would sound good in the real world. So then you might turn to something like perceptual evaluation. But now the problem is, is that, of course, people have all kinds of opinions about audio. So if we got four audio engineers in this room and asked them to listen to something, they might all have different opinions about what sounds best. And finally, it's really hard to come by high-quality, diverse STEM training data sets. So now let's talk about music and music mixing. So if we think about how a sound recording or song recording is composed, um, it's, it's mixed in a way where you're essentially adding up waveforms. It's a known process. But if we're going to go in the other direction, meaning we're going to take something that's already been recorded and now separate it, we're now in what we would call an inverse problem. Right? There's a lot of unknowns happening. So if you just look at the image right here, you can see that the drums, which are yellow, the vocals that are in the orange, it's all over the place. You don't have a tidy, neat band um, the closest you get to that is something like, uh, you know, bass sometimes in some tracks. Um, so you have a high overlap in frequency. And then you have an unknown mixing process. So we don't know the acoustics of the environment in which a recording was made. And so you can have all kinds of new complications in terms of things like reverberations and effects. So people have been trying to separate sound for a really long time. Um, advances in deep learning really opened up the field. And around 2019, 2020, we saw a handful of open source models that really like, inspired the ecosystem. So Open Unmix, Spleeder, and Demux um, all came out around the same time. And those models were really impressive, and they allowed us to start doing things um, primarily on kind of the pre-processing side for music information retrieval. So think of almost like metadata type tasks, maybe something like beat detection. Um, we were also working on sound separation at this time at AudioShake, but we didn't release our models until 2021. Um, at the time, that was also when Sony ran its first demixing challenge, and we won that, and that was to find the best music separation models. Um, our models were an order of magnitude, and are an orders of magnitude um, better than the open source models, um, meaning that they were several decibels higher in quality. And that now then pushed us into uh, areas where we could now make stems more usable in more professional contexts, so bringing those experiences closer to the listener. So you look at the trajectory, and there's still a lot to be done. If you look at the trajectory 
um, just over the past few years. We started off in a place where a lot of um, stem separation was powering uh, back-end or kind of metadata type tasks. And now we're moving closer and closer to the listener. So if we look today, you could think of something like spatial audio or immersive audio. There's a whole bunch of different kind of jargony terms to describe it. Um, but think of Dolby Atmos, Sony 360, essentially a kind of surround sound type experience. Those are powered by stems because you need to be able to place sound objects in different perceptual fields. Um, music education, like playing along with the band, isolating a guitar. Or karaoke, if you've ever seen Apple sing, for example, that's using source separation so that you can sing along to the instrumental. And then, of course, remixing. Most remixes are using some sort of editing of the vocal or the percussion. So Audio Shake differentiates itself in three key ways. Uh, first, we have the highest metrics across our models. Second, an artist-centric approach from day one. Um, as musicians, it was really important to us that these be useful technologies for uh, content owners and artists. And so we licensed our data from the start and also uh, worked hand in hand with artists and labels to really understand what was useful for them. If you remember what I was saying about audio being really subjective, you can, a challenge that you have in, say, music separation models is that you can get the crispest separation, but you might lose something like presence. And that actually isn't, that, that might work again if it's a back-end metadata task, but that's the wrong kind of separation if someone's mixing something in an immersive environment and wants to retain all of that presence from the original recording. Uh, and then finally, we're available in multiple ways. So labels and artists, for example, will tend to use our on-demand platform where they simply drag in an asset and then pick the stems they want. But for developers, we have APIs and we also have SDKs um, for edge devices. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about our models and um, some of the different content workflows that they help power. So on the music side, we separate nine different uh, instrument stems and have more coming. What you can do with that, there's a lot of really cool creative opportunities. So for example, um, SZA's producer used Audio Shake to isolate a 1998 session with ODB and put that onto one of her tracks in her most recent album. Uh, De La Soul used it to um, split all of their albums into stems so that they could remaster those original tracks and get those um, tracks onto streaming. And Nina Simone's estate used stems to be able to create um, that immersive Dolby Atmos mix for her music. Uh, and finally, Green Day used Audio Shake to be able to let fans play along with the band. Uh, they took the track 2,000 Light Years Away, split it uh, into vocals, drums, and bass, so everything but the guitar, uploaded that to TikTok, and that made it possible for fans to play along and basically replace Billy Joe in the band and become the guitarist in Green Day. And finally, it's worth noting, what's really cool about stem separation is that you can open up oh, like audio to kinds of new experiences that we haven't seen before. Because typically working with audio um, and working with, say, real stems is a really manually intensive task. So if you think of gaming, someone will license 10 or 20 tracks. And then there's a huge amount of work that goes into first obtaining the stems and then preparing it for that environment. But imagine that you could design a game or an AR experience where the experience could be reactive to sound and at scale and for thousands or millions of songs, whether or not you've actually ever seen that song before and had all of its stems. So that's a pretty exciting area that I think we're going to see a lot of um, work in over the next couple of years. Uh, and finally, getting these models onto edge devices is um, a pretty tricky task. They're really large, as I was saying earlier. Um, but earlier this year, we launched, um, we brought our, uh, we launched our first uh, SDK for edge devices with our launch partner was uh, Algorithm that makes DJ Pro. And here you can see uh, someone is manipulating the stems in real time uh, on device. Finally, our work in instrument separation then brought us into film and TV, where people started to ask us if we could separate dialogue, music, and effects. Now, there are a lot of learnings, clearly, that you can bring from music into the film and TV environment, but there's a lot of new challenges. So, for example, um, effects can overpower dialogue. Um, uh, another one would be that music and effects can sometimes sound really similar. And finally, what do you do when you have, for example, spoken speech, and in the background, you have someone singing? 
if a producer would not want to get a dialogue stem that has both that speech and also say Drake in the same stem. So AudioShake's models address these challenges. Um, and the first project that we ever worked on was around localization of Doctor Who. So the iconic BBC show, they wanted to bring it into uh, German language. And the problem was all they had was uh, the original show with the director's commentary on top of it and the music effects all in a single track. So we separated out the music and effects and then the local German studio was able to put in the human dub and they stitched those together. Another use for dialogue, music, and effects separation is just to focus on the dialogue piece of it, so speech separation. So speech separation, passing speech through um, audio shake before it goes into technology like, say, ASR transcription, boosts the accuracy. Because if you think about ASR, it's generally, um, it generally works really well. It would work great with what I'm doing right now. But if we added music to the background, or if a lot of you were talking at the same time, the transcription accuracy would typically plummet. It's just too much noise for the system. Um, that's where Audio Shake comes in. We clean that speech before it goes through transcription, and a lot of our customers in this area have reported increases of anywhere from 25 to 40 percent increase in accuracy. It can be also used to train synthetic voice models. So what's interesting is if you actually combine these, these two things, the dialogue separation and the M&E separation, you can also now look at workflows um, that are not just traditional dubbing, like I described with the Doctor Who scenario, but you can also think of human AI hybrid or full AI workflows. So the media file comes in, audio shake separates the dialogue and the music and effects. That speech then goes through ASR and it's transcribed. It might be put into captioning might be put into synthetic voice, um, or at that point, they might use the human voice. And then it's paired with the localized file. So you now see today that full range of localization experiences from really premium, let's say, localization um, with human dubbing and, and so forth and composers involved and everything through to f like 100% AI localization. Next, one of the things that working in film really exposed us to and is really is a big focus for us right now is multi-speaker separation. So the state-of-the-art models on speaker separation are pretty good at identifying speakers um, and are used quite a bit for transcription-like tasks. And again, you have that challenge of noisy environments, but generally there's a ton of work being done on speech separation, um, particularly in terms of low-resolution audio. Right? It's metadata purposes that then go into, I'd say transcription is probably one of the biggest ones uh, along with like assistant technologies. But one of the challenges is if you can, no one has really cracked outputting that in high resolution. Different kinds of tasks, right? The first one is largely uh, metadata. The second one is actually separating that audio into separate streams so that then they can be edited. So that's a, a very tricky, um, a tricky problem. We have not cracked it, but I wanted to give you a bit of a peek at what we're, um, we're working on, because uh, we're pretty excited about this area. You've got to realize these are the people uh, that are at the pinnacle of technology. And, and they're, they're having very slumber very parties. Was that yeah, they're was very aware. You've got to realize these are the people that are at the pinnacle of technology. And, and they're having they're slumber aware. parties. Yeah, they're very aware. So you had there, I don't know how easy it was here in the room, you had essentially three speakers there, um, uh, Joe Rogan, his sidekick, and then Elon Musk, and they were separated into different streams. Um, well, you tied to that, we're also really interested in multi-singer separation. How could we not be interested in this, being um, all musicians? So what's interesting is there are obviously some learnings that you get working on speech that can apply to singing. Singing is actually an even more difficult task. Um, when we're talking about speech, if you and I are having a conversation, we tend to be generally polite and are taking turns. But in singing, that's not really the goal. Quite often, if we are both singing together, we are, um, uh, our harmonies might be overlapping. The chords can also overlap. So you, and then on top of that, you have all of the noisy audio problems that we already have, say, with transcription scenarios, too. Um, so here is an example of where we are right now with multi-singer separation. And anywhere I would have followed you oh, oh. And anywhere I would have followed you oh, oh. Anywhere
last area I wanted to talk about was lyric transcription. So again, there's a lot of work that's been done around speech and uh, speech transcription, and it generally works really, really well, particularly in clean audio environments like this one right now. Um, but lyric transcription is different, right? You have, if you just think about it, we don't sing the same way that we speak, right? I might stretch out certain letters, for example. We have all the noisy audio problems of music in the background. Um, and there's a lot more, uh, we can have multi-singers, for example, singing the same things or different things at the same time. Lots of interesting challenges on lyrics. It's also then probably, again, it's not as big of a field as, say, speech transcription, so it hasn't been studied as much. And so this interested us a lot to see if there was something we could contribute to, to the field. Um, so we started with what we learned from working on localization and working with transcription companies and thought, well, if we isolate the acapella first, and then build our own transcription and alignment models, couldn't we push this a bit further? So we've set new state-of-the-art benchmarks across both lyric transcription and word alignment. Um, and lyric transcription can power all kinds of interesting workflows, primarily, of course, all in the music space. Um, things like metadata extraction, so being able to find explicit language, um, being able to search across a database of songs for different kinds of topics. These are sort of day-to-day uh, -day issues that the music industry grapples with. And then there's a lot of consumer-facing experiences, too, like, say, karaoke um, or lyric videos, um, lots of different kind of fan engagement type of things that intersect with lyrics where um, really fast, accurate transcription can be useful. So I think the things that um, we're really excited about at AudioShake is how can you get these models faster, more performant, um, to be able to power new kinds of uses that are out of reach today. So if we think about the future, um, today we're not able, for example, to um, separate and upmix audio into immersive environments like on the fly. But maybe one day, um, there's also a cool, this is not something we're working on, but it's really inspiring to see the work that people are doing on hearing aids, for example, in relation to sound separation. So there's just, you, when you really start thinking about it, it's, it's pretty exciting to think of where it can go if we can get over some of these big challenges around um, model size and so forth. And with that, we'd be happy to open it up to Q&A. Thanks so much.